On this edition of Independent Sources, Tsunami Fatigue, some Japanese say enough as they grow tired of the media coverage of the tsunami and its fallout. Women in the recession, public sector slashing leaves more women jobless in the second wave of the economic recession. And as yoga lost its roots, a few practitioners in the Hindu community seem to think so. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. And I'm Diana Ravinka. The images of the wall of water washing away cars, homes, and bodies have been all over the news these last few days. The world has joined Japan in mourning its dead and dealing with the fallout from that titanic tsunami. Some of the international media have even commented about the Japanese people's poise while dealing with the disaster. But that's not the whole story. I sat down with Maki Hatai of NHK, Japan Broadcasting Corporation, to talk about some of the reactions to the media's coverage of the aftermath of the disaster. What we've seen in the mainstream media here in terms of uh, reactions to the disaster have been headlines uh, that spoke about uh, panic, about uh, shock, great concern. That was uh, mostly in the days, uh, immediate days following uh, the tsunami. And then, of course, you've had some stories talking about people reacting with uh, stoicism in the face of the disaster. What's your assessment of how people really reacted in Japan? Um, initially, as you said, there was a lot of confusion um, about um, what happened basically with the tsunami, uh, earthquake and tsunami, and uh, during, during the, the first hours, um, immediate areas, uh, even in downtown Tokyo, um, there were a lot of people who um, could not find their way home because the train stopped because electric no electricity. Um, and uh, in the suburb areas as well. Um, it was quite a, a large quake, even in Tokyo area and surrounding. So even um, um, uh, quite a, a ways away from the epicenter, uh, people felt this quake much larger than usual. So people were scared and initial impact um, on people, I believe was definitely a, a sense of panic. And, but then after that, they have um, uh, kind of regrouped themselves and um, uh, started seeing these news reports from the devastated areas where um, uh, they needed help. So I feel people have uh, changed their views to this sort of disaster um, from first being panicked by them themselves to sort of now we have to do something. So, um, as you mentioned, that there is sort of a sense of stoicism um, amongst our people. Um, many di disasters over Japan has overcome uh, in the past that uh, people have um, uh, kept um, their cool in a way um, throughout. Um, Did it have to do with uh, the fact that the country was very well prepared to this sort of disaster? I believe earthquake. Uh, people are ready for earthquake um, but not to the not to this large tsunami that we had that was unexpected the size the scope um, um, the extent of damage um, it's all was unpredicted so I believe people are ready to get the big one big earthquake and then people are always told to be ready for that um, I tell my American friends that in, in Tokyo you have maps that sold in bookstores that you know that tells you how to get home on foot even you know you are 30 40 kilometers away um, so people were ready for the earthquake but not the tsunami or the um, consequence after the tsunami how um, people needed help in the north at the same time the surrounding uh, Ibaragi and a little bit south of where um, the nuclear reactors are right now. Um, those areas also got affected. Um, their infrastructures are 
are uh, broken and uh, they don't have water, electricity, gas. So there were much bigger damage from this earthquake than people ever expected. So, uh, you know, now you can see how many people are missing and dying that this is the biggest disaster we've ever had since World War II. So no one could really um, expected this and be prepared completely for this, I believe. Do you find that uh, younger generations are reacting perhaps differently than older generations who uh, might have been born closer to the date when Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened? I think younger people sort of in Japan in the recent years, in the last decade or so, um, have been looking for something that they could um, do or participate. Uh, there has been um, many discussions about uh, uh, kind of despondent youth that um, could not find what to do when they become older or uh, the sense of purpose in their lives. And I think initially it's giving them a lot of um, um, sort of uh, purpose to help. Uh, so there are many, many volunteers that are trying to go up north to, ha to help. And now we don't have infrastructure for sort of NGOs or groups that um, organizes them all, but now it's, you, you're seeing a lot of people trying to volunteer, and many of them are young people. So if within the youth, I see um, bigger reaction, perhaps, than older people, yeah. We've spoken to some young people from the community here in New York, and they say that their families back home feel that uh, uh, the coverage of, of the disaster has been too overwhelming for, for them here and also back home, and they, uh, they do want it to, 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 to stop at, at some point. Is that uh, your assessment as well? Um, my assessment, I live in the news business, so I feel that the people need information. So NHK, as a public broadcaster, we try to provide um, the cor right, correct information that people should know, at the same time, things that people uh, need to know. Um, we try to give them as much information at a time that's available, and but not with the speculation. Um, there, I think there are a lot of speculative uh, reports that are uh, in regards to the nuclear plants, um, what they're, what, what, what's being done there. And that gives, I, I believe, um, a lot of fear in people, um, and people become very uncomfortable. Um, in the mainstream media, uh, international media, or in the Japanese media in Japan? Um, looking at international media, I feel it's, it's very elaborate. It's very, it, it's to the point exaggerated. Um, uh, perhaps um, maybe I, I come from the public broadcasting point of view, so uh, we try not to say or speculate uh, what perhaps is the, is the case. Um, uh, but uh, American media overall, I, I believe, is a little bit uh, overwhelming to me. <laughs> but uh, in Japan, I, I see both ways. There are people who want to know more. There are people who want to shut it out and, and want to go back to the normal life. Um, but people do need, people feel that they need uh, information, especially on this issue of nuclear um, power plant and what's, what's being done there. Um, but um, a lot of young people are getting information through internet and uh, um, many people call for getting their own information about radi uh, radiation. Um, that is that is uh, that is the case, I believe, for uh, Japanese people when they get when they get tired of the media mainstream medium, they they go to the internet, and, and they know they can go to the internet. And we have to wrap it here, unfortunately. Maki Hatai, thank you for joining us in studio today. Yonk. Still to come on independent sources: Why are women losing and having a harder time finding jobs in the second wave of this recent recession? Before that, Jessica Courtemanche has some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. There are more homicides in the city, and the number of murders in the black community has increased, according to an NYPD report. 
The Amsterdam News reports that the number of blacks who were murdered was up by 31 percent, while the number of whites murdered was down by 27 percent. Brooklyn was the deadliest borough last year, with 24 percent of all city murders. From El Diario La Prensa, the Dominican consulate in New York City awarded 10 people with a merit order recognizing community achievements. The order was given as recognition for their professional work, which encompasses politics, medicine, arts, and community development. Recipients included Senator Jose Peralta, reporter Fernando Aquino, and singer Francisco Casanova. The State Department has issued a fraud warning against a scam concerning the diversity visa lottery program. According to the Filipino reporter, there have been reports of emails, websites and print ads falsely notifying people that they've won and offering them visa services, all for a fee. The U.S. Embassy in Manila has advised people to be careful before deciding to give out any of their financial or personal information. And finally, last week was St. Patrick's Day, and this week the Irish community has another reason to celebrate. The Irish Central reports that an Irish-American priest is ascending the steps towards sainthood. Father Nelson Baker lived from 1842 to 1936 and served in Buffalo, New York. This week, the Vatican made him venerable, which is a status just below that of blessed in the Catholic Church. He would be the first Irish-American to become a saint. Those were just a few of the headlines from the ethnic media. Back to Gary and Vianora in the studio. Thanks, Jessica. As of February of this year, the United States unemployment rate was at 8.9%. According to the Department of Labor Statistics, that's down from last year. However, it seems that as the economy is recovering in certain sectors, there are others, like the public sector, where major cuts are being made. I sat down with Heather Boucher, of the Center for American Progress and reporter Michelle Chen to talk about how these cuts are affecting women in particular. Thanks for being here. The recession of the past few years generated huge job losses in industries dominated by men. Now has state and local governments respond to budget crunches by slashing spending and cutting government jobs, a second recession wave has emerged. This time, the casualties are largely women. Michelle Garcia filed this report. I'm Crystal Lisquello. I'm 22, about to be 23 years old. I work at, at the Nordic Public Library. This yeah. is um, Pedro Albizu Campos. He's a huge independence, pro-independence uh, movement uh, leader. It kind of reminds me that you just fight for what you want, as corny as that sounds. It's a photograph that has given Crystal strength that she and her sister Lillian and mother Carmen have weathered an economic thunderstorm. I finished my bachelor's in May, so I initially said, let me start looking for full-time work. It's been, what, about eight to nine months. I've had about ten interviews. But why would you hire me at a lower price when you can hire somebody who's been out of work for maybe a year or two with more experience and is willing to take that lower salary? According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, nearly 20 percent of those in her age group are unemployed. Given those facts, she counts herself lucky to have a job, a job that reflects working conditions in a tight economy. I need security, just like anybody else. So working a job at $13 an hour with no benefits as a consultant as opposed to being on someone's payroll is very difficult. I always have to scramble for money for health insurance. And last year, incoming New Jersey Governor Chris Christie slashed state spending. The state was actually in danger of running out of cash within weeks of not being able to meet payroll. State spending translates in part into funding for the Latino Institute where her mother worked. My mother lost her job and I just picked up the slack. It's, it's bad. It's, it's, it's been one of the lowest points in my life besides, um, I want to get emotional. Besides my father leaving, <laughs> it's just been very difficult. I hate the fact that my, my oldest daughter has to um, chip in so much and, and take over so many of, of, of the responsibilities. Can we stop? Yeah, we can stop. 
First, there was last year's recession known as the man session. 70% of jobs lost belong to men. In the second wave, unemployment among women is on the rise from 7.8% to 8.1% by the end of last year. And for single moms like Carmen, the rate shoots up to 12.7%. One reason, many women rely on state and local jobs. In the meantime, while I'm waiting, I don't want to be sitting home and giving my children the wrong message that, you know, I'm going to be lazy and stay home until I find a job. Because for me, this is not a job. This is a, this is a, a career. Crystal expects to earn a master's degree in May and plans to follow in her mother's tracks, working in nonprofit management. Public service is something in my blood. I just absolutely do not know what my life would be if I'm not helping someone. Ready? <laughs> For Independent Sources, I'm Michelle Garcia. No, it's all right. Heather, I want to start with you. Uh, how typical is this story? Uh, and, and also, what role does uh, uh, race and ethnicity play in these latest unemployment figures? Well, certainly, you know, it, it continues to be really tough out there. And that story was incredibly compelling and is um, the kind of thing that we're, we continue to see all across America. You know, the, um, the unemployment rate rose um, over the past few years, all over the past couple of months now. Um, and primarily, that's been because men have been getting jobs, not because women have. I mean, you know, we should sort of be very careful, you know, while it was a case that men had jobs over the recession over 2008, 2009, and 2007, um, you know, it was a case that women lost, a, you know, a, a, a good chunk of jobs. But you would expect as jobs um, start coming back that men would get them because, you know, they, they had a sharper fall. They have a steeper climb to get back to where they were. But I think what we're seeing right now is just, just how hard things are out there for everyone. Um, and there are, you know, you asked about race um, and ethnicity. There, there continue to be wide disparities in unemployment and how hard people have been hit hit by race and ethnicity, you know, African Americans continue to have excruciatingly high unemployment rates, especially for young folks, but also for older workers as well. So, I mean, I think that, you know, one way of looking at this is that there, there are a wide variety of experiences, but it does remain the case that the labor market is really tough um, for most folks out there. And I'll sort of note that even though we've seen job creation, We've seen jobs created over the past year, and that's fantastic. We've got so many folks on the sidelines, so many folks who've been searching for a long time, maybe they've given up, but who are likely to come back in as soon as we start seeing job growth really strengthen. So it's going to be quite some time before we're going to see a, a, a robust labor market. Well, you know, Michelle, the other interesting element to this is that unmarried uh, men and women have a higher rate of unemployment than their married counterparts. How do you explain that? Um, simply, uh, well, the unemployment rate among single mothers especially, um, that really ties into issues of uh, race and gender as well. So you see extraordinarily um, high rates of unemployment, uh, even among women. It's, it's vastly disproportionate among women of color. And that, of course, intersects as well with, um, with uh, single mom-headed households, as we saw in Michelle Garcia's story. Um, and, you know, this is not the stereotype of the welfare queen. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we saw in that household that we profiled, um, this is a group of very strong, independent-minded women. College-educated, in that Certainly. Um, and with, uh, you know, certainly um, uh, very much um, uh, embedded in, a, in an idea of public service. Um, you know, these are not folks who um, are content to just sit on the sidelines. But again and again, they're sort of uh, sidelined by the economy and by these structural issues. Um, there are huge barriers that they face in terms of access, equal access to opportunities. Um, even in the federal stimulus, we saw that a lot of those um, jobs that were, um, you know, going towards these so-called shovel-ready projects, um, you know, that will, of course, disproportionately benefit men. And uh, just in terms of uh, cuts to the public sector especially, um, women have historically made up the majority of uh, the public sector workforce um, and uh, and we see that they've the public sector has been hit hard especially in places like new jersey um, where governor christie is busy slashing away at education well this is happening across the country nationwide Certainly. states are in all type of fiscal mm -hmm. 
and budgetary problems. Right. right. Um, what we saw in Wisconsin, um, the uh, the labor actions over there, um, that was very much a direct response to um, not just an attack on working people, but an attack on working families, um, especially women um, who are carrying a lot of the burden in this recession. Heather, from a policy standpoint, what can the public sector and the private sector do to improve conditions for women? Well, I think one of the first things to do is to recognize that, you know, these, that the kinds of jobs that women and men do are valuable jobs. I mean, it, it's a real unfortunate tale here at this point because you're seeing um, so many people uh, clamoring for budgets to be cut right when families need that the most. I mean, not only do they need the services that those valuable public sector workers uh, provide, but it remains the case that those workers um, are disproportionately women, as Michelle said, and especially at the local level. You know, we've seen among uh, local workers uh, since the recession, quote unquote, officially ended back in June of 2009, that nearly 300,000 jobs have been lost for women and about a half, a, uh, about 50,000 jobs have been lost for men. So, um, so I think that one of the things we could be doing better is making sure that the, the public sector isn't adding to our unemployment woes by laying people off just when our economy can least afford it. Now, that is uh, pretty much an uphill battle, it seems like, here in Washington these days, and I know in state houses around the country. So, um, but I, I think this is exactly what we should continue to advocate for. Michelle, what about the private sector? I mean, after all, this is their uh, responsibility. They've gotten huge bailouts to the banks in particular. And, and what can be done? I mean, this is a serious uh, problem. Certainly, the private sector has been um, hard hit, and you could uh, you can make the argument that uh, private sector workers have sort of really taken it in the neck, and uh, the public sector has fared a little bit better. But um, one of the reasons for that is um, that um, uh, unions have been really strong in the public sector, um, and what gets hidden a lot in all this attack on public sector workers and these supposedly you know lavish compensation and benefit packages that they're getting um, that's actually just a real myth. Um, the problem is not that um, the public sector is, you know, especially wasteful. It's actually that the private sector has been eating away at workers' rights. Um, and, again, that disproportionately impacts on people of color, women, um, single motherhood households, etc. And uh, the other piece of this, of course, is that as these public programs are getting cut, um, that really eats into um, household budgets on the social services side and a lot of the resources that they would normally have to fall back on um, are being sort of uh, ripped out from you know, the floors being pulled out from under them just as uh, the private sector is uh, sort of, you know, really uh, shedding jobs at a record rate. Heather, what's being done in, in, in the advocacy world in terms of really getting companies and, and, and state uh, governors to, to, to address this issue? Certainly, what's the most important thing, one of the most important things that happened, of course, was the, the president signing the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, over two years ago now that pumped uh, billions of dollars into communities all around the country and, and created and saved millions of jobs. Um, but, you know, those dollars are waning now. And I think that the challenge is that... You know, it seems in some sense, you know, when you think about unemployment, the, the time that people oftentimes focus on it is when unemployment is snowballing, when things are getting worse and worse. Of course, it remains the case that things are as bad, almost as bad as they've ever been for many families out there. So in terms of uh, thinking about what we need to do for the economy, keeping the government focused with its eyes on the prize that that recovery means a recovery in jobs is certainly the most important thing. But like I said, I mean, it's certainly tough with a new Congress here in town that is not inclined to continue to spend. When you have an economy where the, the easiest way to do job creation would be to boost spending, you're really stuck in quite a pickle because policymakers are, um, they're, they're not, quite frankly, they're not going down the right path right now. Unfortunately, we have to leave the conversation here. Michelle Chen, Heather Boucher, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been a, a real good to be on. Thanks for having me. When we come back, Hindu yoga practitioners say their sacred form is going too mainstream and losing its roots.
And finally, when members of the Hindu American Foundation noticed that Hinduism's relationship to yoga was becoming diluted here in the United States, they decided to take action. They launched the Take Back Yoga campaign to address this mainstreaming of their sacred form. But some non-Hindu yoga practitioners aren't convinced that anyone has the right to claim ownership of the ancient practice. Abby Ishola filed this report. To many devout Hindus, yoga is the joining of one's soul with the universal supreme god. Here at the Hindu Temple of North America in Queens, yoga practitioners combine asanas, or popular yoga stretch poses, with meditation, prayer, and chanting. Dr. Uma Mysokar, president of the organization, says yoga is a lot more than just an exercise method. It's the basis of Hindu scripture. A yoga means to me is ultimately what I aspire for is my devotion to the Lord uh, and my ultimate goal, which is the salvation. Jana Gayashevich, owner of the yoga room in Astoria, has a different relationship with the practice. She says yoga has helped her become healthier, more patient, and more aware within the 10 years she's been practicing and teaching. But Hinduism is the furthest thing from her mind. I don't know much about exactly Hinduism and yoga. I mean, from what I understand, Hinduism was based on the yoga. It's not like Hindus created yoga and they created the poses and everything. So that's the reason I don't know where the claim come from. Um, then Buddhism should claim yoga too, or? It's this disconnect and uncertainty about the origin of yoga that's being debated among yoga practitioners and leaders in the Hindu community. Yoga is essentially rooted in Hindu philosophy. What we find here in the West is only one part of yoga, just the asana, which is only the physical practice of yoga. Sheetal Shah is the senior director of the Hindu American Foundation. She and her team launched a campaign called Take Back Yoga when they noticed some yoga publications left the word Hinduism out of their reports on the ancient practice. One of the things that we found, particularly with Yoga Journal, which is one of the more popular yoga magazines, is that it had a lot of references to Hindu texts, for example, the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishadas or the Vedas, but it never overtly called them Hindu. It called them ancient Indian, it called them yogic, it called them tantric. Shah and her team contacted Yoga Journal for answers. She claims a representative from the magazine said they avoid using the term Hindu because it carries too much baggage. What do you think they mean by t too much baggage? Where do you think that comes from? Particularly in the West, Hinduism has largely been portrayed as a faith of caste, cow, and karma. Anything that's strange, anything that's exotic, anything that's colorful, gods with multiple arms and heads, that's kind of how Hinduism has been portrayed in the West. Yoga Journal denies the claim and sent us this response via email. Look at our timeline of yoga in our recent 35th anniversary issue, where we feature great moments in yoga, many of which directly references yoga's Hindu origins, including Tantra, the Bhagavad Gita, Patanjali, and other sacred icons of Hindu religion and philosophy. Shah says the Take Back Yoga campaign has been successful at generating dialogue about the true origins of the practice. Yet some still question if anyone really owns yoga or if Hindus have the right to take it back. Take Back Yoga campaign, take it back where, who, how can anybody claim something that is so ancient and so old? I think yoga belongs to everybody. And to that, the Hindu leaders we spoke to say they're happy people all over the world are reaping the benefits of yoga, but they believe people should give credit where they say credit is due. For Independent Sources, Abby Ashola. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. We hope to see you again next time. Till then, be independent-minded.